Amen. Amen. But blended and unashamed because I think it's a it's an area that maybe the church doesn't really do a whole lot in in dealing with the blended situations. And so I want to just give what the Lord put on my heart to you today. And yeah, it it may be a little tough. It was tough for me. It was tough for me. And uh, um, but I think there's some some healing that will be involved with it. Um, Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. We ask for a new anointing. A new anointing, a fresh anointing, Lord God. I don't want first services anointing, Lord God. But I want second services anointing, Lord God. That, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place, Lord God, and you would begin to prick hearts, Lord God, and move us in the direction that you would have us to go in, Father God. It's all about you, Lord God. I'm just a vessel being used willingly, Father God, to say what you put on my heart to get to your people, Lord God, so I don't take offense at anything anymore, Father God, because I know you do the drawing, not Derek. Lord God, I know you do the the pricking, Lord God. So use me in the way that I will come today, Lord God, to bless your name, to give you the glory, to give you the power, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If I had a big idea for uh, this series or, or for this lesson today, it would be to tell each of you that there's, at least for me, but I think for you as well, there's things that we hide in our hearts that we don't give over to God. We never lay it at his feet. And what ends up happening is is that we become the God in that area of our life. And we try to dictate what's going on instead of giving that to God and letting God work on it. So if there's anything that I would give for you today that I would want you to take away from this place today, is that we got to learn to give it up. And what we'll find out is some of these things that are in our heart, we don't even know how they got there. And we may not even know that we're operating on them. But we can be. So, baby, if you'd uh, take me to the next slide, I want to give you some statistics. Oh, first, I want to give you a working definition for what I call blended. A family unit where one or both parents come into the marriage with a child or children from a previous relationship. The parents may or may not have children together, but they come together in a marriage with desires to blend their two families. And just by a show of hand, if you're not ashamed, how many blended families do we have here today? Amen. Amen. It it, it runs around half. It runs around half all the time. Uh, Next slide. Next slide. So let me give you some facts really quick. 1,300 new step families are formed every single day. Every single day. Over 50% of U.S. families are remarried. Marriage today are lasting about seven years. Mine lasted about five. 50% of marriages end in divorce, one out of two. 67% of that 50 are remarried and end up breaking up when children are involved. And 73% of the 67 that get remarried, end up in divorce. So my situation was divorce after five years. Pam's situation was divorced with a nine-year-old child. When we decided to come together and make that union and blend, nobody gave me a book on raising children because I didn't have any at that time. And boy, I tell you, I made a lot of mistakes. And I own it. Very angry with some things that have went on in my life. Didn't know how I was dealing with them. And that, that went on to my family. Not a good guy. Not a good guy. Didn't know it then. But as you mature and you grow, you look back on things. Not long. Don't look back long. 
Because it'll get you if you look back long. But you begin to look back on things. And you say, oh, yeah. Boy, the Lord had to help me through this. And I didn't even know it. So I I, want to go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to talk about this thing, shame. In unashamed. I think a large part of our issue is we bring in so much brokenness into the next thing that we, the unresolved brokenness. And we begin to put things on our mates, on our spouses, because of the last situation. So we, we come into things with low trust and high expectation. And the foundation hasn't even been set. And you're comparing the two situations. And it makes things happen differently. Let me read, if you, if you turn with me to Genesis um, chapter 3. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to go verses 7 through 13. Let, let's talk a little bit about the shame. And uh, what happened in the early days. Genesis 3, starting there at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from him the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me. So he's going to blame God and Eve. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent blamed somebody else, blamed the devil, and she ate. So when we begin to look at this, and you begin to see what happened in a perfect situation. Eden was a perfect situation. But you can see the things that begin to get in your mind and you have to begin to deal with them. So that serpent was in Eve's mind and she wanted to be like God. And what that ended up doing to them, like it does to us, it ends up, uh, when we take it in, our innocence, that childlike innocence is gone when we begin to sin. So we have to begin to look at things in a different way. When God came down in the cool of the day, they always fellowship with him. But this time they ran and hide and hid because they're afraid because that's what sin begins to do to us. It makes you hide. It makes you hide and not want to deal with things. It keeps things covered up, and that's all that was doing. It was covering them up. From the shame that they had experienced in the garden. So the fig leaves, they covered up their private areas. Where before they didn't do that because they were free. They didn't have nothing to hide. But see, the fig trees end up, uh, fig leaves end up being those problems that we don't deal with and we try to cover. See, that's why now I'm beginning to understand more and more why psychiatrists take us back to our childhood and why counselors take us back in those areas because things in our life happen at very young age, at a young age, and they manifest themselves as we grow. So when we begin to look at that situation and things are growing on the inside of us like that, 
we begin dealing with things differently. And, 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 and the real issue is not the alcoholism. It's, it's the fact that daddy left me when I was young. It's not the pornography that I look at in my basement. It's because I had a sexual issue with somebody that took advantage of my innocence. And what I begin to end up doing is I begin putting fig leaves and covering myself with those because I don't deal with them properly. And that's my situation. Taking my innocence from me at a young age. And you have to deal with those kind of things as you grow. And those things begin to manifest in your life and you don't know why it's manifesting. And what that begins to create are things called inner vows to protect ourselves. We use inner vows. They may say, they may be like something like this. I'm never going to be poor again in my life. And, and when you use that inner vow, what happens in that inner vow? And let me tell you what it means. Inner vows we make to ourselves to help deal with our shame. And where we have made a self-promise, we become the lords of that area, not Jesus. So we begin to pick and choose what we want God to take from us. And when we pick and choose that, we become the lords of that area. So then we deal with it and God doesn't. And what that does is weaken the foundation that we're on. Puts cracks all in our foundation because we think we're strong enough to do it. And we're not. Only the blood can do it, y'all. You hear what I'm talking about? Only the blood can do it. So we make these inner vows and they become heart problems. And let me tell y'all what these heart, I, I, I didn't do this first service, but the Lord is leading me differently. Proverbs 4 and 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. When we begin to conceal this stuff, we put it in our heart. Now, man looks at the what? And what does God look at? The heart. And everything flows from our heart. It flows from our heart. Listen to this one. Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. King David meant that. King David dealt with some stuff in his life. In my studies, I came across King David. Mom might have been a prostitute. And it begins to tell you about maybe why he did what he did with Absalom. But he had a daughter named Tamar and a son named Amnon. And Ta Am Amnon raped Tamar. And David didn't do nothing about it. Oh, Lord, create something new in me. Then Absalom, her whole brother, came into the situation. And when he came into the situation, what did he do? Fooled Abnon and killed him. And David did nothing. I believe David is crying out in that verse. Lord God created me a new heart. See, when we don't let turn it over to God, it stays in here. It's like congestive heart failure. We can't get nothing out. What's that other verse? Psalms 37 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. How will the Lord give you the desires of your heart when we got so much weight on it? We got weight that we won't release. And so it's hard to get the desires of your heart because it's full of other stuff that we won't give to him. So we got to think about that. Next slide. 
I want to take you all to uh, 1 John 1 through 5, and I want to deal with a little bit of how maybe we can deal with the shame. 1 John 5 through 10. 1 John. Walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It's not in us. If we don't let the past die, if we don't let the past die, then our future will never live. It's like, it's like driving in your vehicle, driving in your vehicle with your head out the window, looking at the rear view mirror while you're driving. You bound to crash. Let the past die so the future can live. And the only way that we can do that is come into his marvelous light. God is light. When we sin and we hide it, we bury it, and it causes darkness. So Matthew uh, eleven twenty nine and 30 says, take my yoke. Come learn from me. And I'll make your path lighter, your burdens lighter. I'll give you rest. I'll give your soul rest. See, most of us, at least I did, get tired of running. Covering up lie after lie after lie. That stuff is stressful. You know what I'm talking about? I, I was there. I was there. Transparent. And you keep doing it, and you, you, you have to cover it up, and it's work. But God is saying, let me give you rest. Stop running around doing all this. I want to give you the desires of your heart, but you got to stop, and you got to take my yoke. See, y'all, when we read Genesis, Genesis said, Father God just came down and was just walking in the cool of the day. He came to fellowship with us at any time he felt like it. But we went into sin. We went into sin, and now we got to take that step. Now you got to knock so the door can be opened. You got to take that step. Now you got to take the yoke. You got to make that step in order for him to pull us into the light. Sin, sin creates darkness, and darkness Plus darkness equals what? But when darkness is pulled into the light, you need the sun. S-O-N. You hear what I'm talking about? To be able to cleanse our hearts and our path. You got to trust him. What he's saying to you. If you confess, I will do my part. I will do my part. If you confess. But the problem, even in the body of Christ, in that pandemic of divorce, we're hiding things from God. And we're not bringing them to the altar. Because we want to protect it. And that thing feels good. Holy Ghost, help me today. It's the blood. 
We can't do it on our own. The blood is what's going to wash that clean. And we got to start doing that because generations after generations are going through the same thing. And they're watching us do it in the body of Christ. You got to forgive. You got to forgive. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is. When I have to look at an uncle that did what he did to me. And to let that thing go, I had to forgive him. I had to do that. Because it was eating me up on the inside. Somebody said it's like a man walking with a bottle of poison. And he drinks that poison. Waiting for somebody else to die. We're killing ourselves. Because we won't let it go. And I know it hurts. I'm up here in front of you telling you when you let it go, God begins to work in you in a new way. He begins to do things that you'll never, ever understand when you let that go, but you got to let it go. You got to let it go. See, forgiveness is not saying that that person was right. Forgiveness sets you free. That's what it does. And when you're able to forgive, God will forgive you. And when you don't forgive, he doesn't forgive you. And we got to own that. We got to own that. Next slide. Got to make marriage first. We got to make marriage first. Y'all hear me? See, what we, try, what we do is, because we don't make marriage first, and we come into that blended situation, and you come in with children already, that's already telling you that the marriage relationship, if you don't do something with it, will take a back seat. Because you're running here with this child. You're running there with that child. Y'all passing through the night. And we don't make time for one another. And we don't do things with one another. And our children begin to suffer. You think you're doing the right thing. You think you're doing the right thing. But I'm here to tell you, until I begin to put Pam first in my life, my children won't know what it means to have a successful relationship, to love through pain, to deal with things that you got to deal with. They won't understand that. And you're setting them up, and I'm setting them up for failure when I don't. You have to put the marriage relationship first. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. See, what children are looking for, and they don't know it, they're children. They are looking for their dad. And the greatest thing a dad can do is love his wife. That's the greatest thing a dad can do for his children and for him to cherish and love his wife. And the greatest thing for a wife to do for her children is to love the child's father and to cherish and to respect him and to give him admiration So that now I begin to role model what a healthy Christian relationship should look like. And my children can see how to navigate. But yet we want to act like the world acts. And we'll go home and get in an argument and go sleep on the couch. I've done it. And let the devil get a foothold in the relationship and begin to pour into you to impact your heart. To impact your heart has to be first. You got to have a shared vision. In my relationship, 
first relationship. The one that ended after five years. I was hurt. Didn't know quite how to deal with it. So what I did, unbeknownst to my wife now, Pam, I began to make visions myself, not including her. And I made my own visions on what my life was going to be. And she was just a piece to put in it. Because I didn't want to get hurt like I did before. So I made that inner vow with myself. So when I began doing that and creating my own vision, and not sharing that with my wife. When trouble hit in 2008 and the, the club that I bought was gone and the houses that I had were gone because I was the Lord of my own finances and God had to bring a brother to his knees to get back right with him. And that's what happened, but I broke the foundation in my marriage. Because I didn't include, I didn't have a shared vision. And I'm still, we, we are 14 years now. So we'd have made it over the, our average. But I'd lie to you if I said there's still not some trouble sometimes. And the foundation ain't all the way fixed. But I can tell you I'm working on it. I can, I'm telling you I'm working on it. Because I've made a decision. That next one. Pam, I've made a decision to be like Jesus and to have that agape love. See, agape love is different than any of the other loves. See, the agape love is a decision. And when you begin to make a decision to say, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stay right in it and we're going to get through what I got to get through with. That's that agape love. See, he came down from on high, y'all, with that agape love. And he said, I know they couldn't do it, and they don't deserve it. Because every Sunday, we come in here and say, I should have been on that cross. Every Sunday, we come in here and say that. It shouldn't have been him. He was righteous. He was without sin. But because he had that agape love, he made a decision. It's a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's an unconditional love. God gives this love unreservedly to those that are undeserving and inferior to himself. Agape love. We got to make a decision to change this thing that's going on in our lives. This epidemic called divorce, where one out of two families, even in Christian households, are saying bye-bye after a certain amount of time. Raising generations to the third and the fourth generation of kids that's going to do the same thing we do. The parent. I own it. I own it. We have to begin to take responsibility for that in our lives. My challenge to us today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about it, just a little. There's these things in our life that we won't let go of that's hiding in our hearts. And we're towards the end of this message. And I want the Holy Spirit, I'm asking the Holy Spirit because he's working through me. That if you have unresolved things in your heart that you have not given over to God to let him handle in your situation, I'm asking you to come to this altar and let's pray. Here's why. You got to take a step. You got to take a step. And today is better than any other day to take a step and allow God to work in our hearts and turn over those things that are plaguing us in our life. And even if you don't know what's plaguing you, because it's been buried deep, deep down, 
the master can get to it. The master can get to it. I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness. It took me a long time to get rid of that thing. It took me a long time. It took some pain. It took some tears. But I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't do it by myself. I needed a God that would say, hey, I got you, D. I got you. And because I have you, you'll be able to do greater things than I will. See, those are what we got to understand. The heart is crucial. The heart is crucial to our survival in this walk. See, we come here each and every Sunday, going churches to churches, and we don't leave writing anything down. That's what the Holy Spirit put on my heart, gave it to first service. I do it. Because I don't think I'm going to show up and the Lord is going to give me anything. So what I do is I keep leaving and coming, coming and going, leaving and coming with an unchanged heart and an unchanged life. With no power. No power. And that's how I felt. No power. The pastor has asked me over and over, Derek, you ready to come back? No. Because I had to deal with Derek. Holy Spirit had to deal with Derek. Derek wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And I didn't want to get up in front of you. Because I've never been fake. Transparency for me has been a great thing in my life because it holds me accountable to a God that loves me. I don't need to hide anymore. I'm not hiding behind trees. I'm not hiding in my car. I'm not hiding anywhere. I'm coming to him straight up. And if I do something wrong, I know how to repent. Because I'm not perfect. And neither are you. We're not perfect. But if we don't turn it over to him, guys, we're in for a life of misery. And you know misery loves company. So you begin to tell other people about your misery, but you never get free until you give it to him. I'm going to ask for all of us to stand up. And if anything has been placed on your heart and you're not afraid, blended and unashamed, if you're not shameful today, this altar has no condemnation. It has no judgment. It doesn't care about what's going on. But I would ask you to join me. And that's what the Holy Spirit put on my heart. If there's any unresolved things in your life that you haven't given over to God, I'm asking you to come. I was there. I'm asking you to come. Not for anybody else to see you, but for you to get out of the situations that we're in today. The Holy Spirit is asking you that if you have unresolved issues in your life, if things are not going the way you think they should be going, if you haven't given it up and you're still being the Lord of that situation, I'm asking you, he's asking you, let us pray for that thing. Give it up to him. Stop holding on to it. Stop holding on to it. He wants you to give it up. He wants you to give it up because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He wants you to give it up. We got time. <laughs> if you're ready to give it up, if you know you need to give it up, today is the best day. Today is where it starts. Give it up so he can use you differently so he can use us differently. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning, Lord God, 
that those that have run to the altar, Lord God, will begin to honor you in a different way. That they will hand over, Lord God, the things that are bogging their heart down, Lord God. Holy Spirit, help us this morning. Show your power. Display your power in their lives, Lord God. Begin to heal, Lord God. Begin to break the, break the stuff up that's going on in here. It's time to operate on that congestive heart failure, Lord God. We want to give it to you, Master. Give it to you, Master. That's our prayer today, is to give it to you, Master, so I can walk differently, so I can talk differently. Take it from me. Making me a clean heart. Making me a clean heart. Making me a clean heart. So I can walk the way you want me to walk, Master. So I can help who you call me to help, Lord God. And I don't have any hang-ups. It's about you, Father God. And those that weren't able to walk, that are still dealing with some shame that they got to deal with, Lord God. I ask you to heal them right where they are, Father God. I ask you to continue to work with them, Lord God. That the Spirit will begin to deal with you in a different way. That I don't continue to show up week after week and sleep on it so the devil can get a foothold in my life. Holy Spirit, show them what's going on. Guide them. Keep them in your perfect, perfect peace. There are consequences for our sin. There are consequences. He still loves us. He still cares about us. But there's consequences for our sins. So we thank you, Father. And we bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.